chuckling on the telephone until she gets that bill for the free rent on Tesco. <laughs> Author Debbie Burke. Debbie, good morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning, and I think I better hang up right now before I get, because I can't afford this. Too late. It's too late. Too late. You're hooked. <laughs> in for a dime, in for a dollar, Debbie. That's just how it goes when you lead off the show. It's a tradition. Well, well, I tell you, I'm going to pass that bill on to John because he's he's so successful. I'm earning so. my way out by being in a studio in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> how do you think? How do you think Gilstrap's working off his tab? He brings in other people to to share the share the cost. Oh mercy, uh, Debbie. Um, first and foremost, John brought uh, you to our attention, and we thank John for that because AI is very much in the news right now. And you are an author who kind of specializes in that and the deep fake, so to speak. Can you tell us how you kind of worked your way onto this genre? Well, I'm uh, I'm a crime writer, and of course, my immediate um, as I'm as I'm researching when I look at a topic, I immediately think, okay, what can be nefarious about this? How can this turn into a crime? Uh, and so that was where I started uh, with my new book, which is coming out April 25th, called Deep Fake Double Down. And uh, that's the the whole concept of deep fakes is just fascinating to me. Um, but I have to issue a disclaimer right now. I am not an expert in the technology at all. Uh, but I've done enough research to be dangerous, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I couldn't I couldn't create a deep fake if you held a gun to my head. But I am concerned about the effects of deep fakes uh, on society, uh, individual people, uh, the political system, global events, and more. We're already in a world full of distrust, and if you can't trust what you see with your own eyes we've really lost touch with reality debbie i'm i'm a, a firm belief here that ai will be the end of civilization and I, I don't say that jokingly i i honestly believe that i don't know if i'll be alive for that or not but i i have seen uh 60 minutes a year or so ago did some uh did a segment on this stuff and it's so real and it's, and it's in its infancy at this moment. So I can't imagine how good it's going to be in five or ten years. But it's so real that you can make any leader of any nation say anything, and it appears to be fact. Absolutely. Um, I, I ran across a comment uh, when I was researching where someone said people in 2025 are going to have a real difficult time with misinformation. Now, I'll say I think that's happening right now and has been happening for some time. Uh, but the other quote that uh, the other part of the quote was people in 2100 won't know which parts of history were real. And I think you may well be right that we are at the end of end of civilization. Rob, if I can, yes, Debbie. Uh, Bill Stubblefield, uh, thanks, Debbie, for joining us. Uh, I get Thank you, Admiral. It's an honor to meet you. Well, you, you have not you been... You clearly there. haven't really met him. <laughs> 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 and, and from that point on, the my mute button will be on. I won't be able to say anything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now we're all going to have to address him like that every single morning. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, am, I, I get confused, and I think a lot of us do, with these... So much uh, coming across, uh, coming at us so fast. Uh, Rob said uh, uh, AI would be the uh, uh, the ruin of us in a few years, and and I tend to agree with part of you said. But the deep fake is only a part of AI, and AI is much much larger than deep fake. Is that correct? Oh yeah, okay. yeah. That's um, you know AI is really what uh, has been driving our uh, technology age for years now, and it is just changing and developing at such a dizzying rate. I mean, we're already out of date uh, just just talking today. They're, they're so far ahead of us. Um, and it's, it's spooky, the idea that machines and... Uh, uh, Artificial intelligence can control our destiny, things like um, whether the power grid works or not, whether this phone conversation gets cut off mid-stream. mid, mid 
stream, um, uh, whether our internet goes down, uh, it's just staggering how much of our life is controlled by artificial intelligence. Oh, that's on the uh, the negative side, the danger side. There's also a a huge positive component as well in engineering, medicine, and so many other things that AI can be uh, a great benefit as long as we can, can can control it. That's absolutely true, and you know we take a lot of these uh, benefits for granted because they just are invisible to us. We're we're used to having. Uh, MRIs and CAT scans and, uh, you know, some of these other developments that, um, hey, it's no big deal. That's the way it happens. Um, however, I will say there is one development that I really don't like, and that is uh, the autocorrect. And uh, I ran across a recent example of that when I was putting this appointment for the for the interview into my phone calendar. And I wrote in, uh, you know, in the appointment, radio interview with John Gilstrap. However, autocorrect changed that to John Girls Trap. <laughs> that's, yeah. what we, that's what we call them around here, too. <laughs> yeah. You know, these things can have legs. Please don't say stuff like that. <laughs> and, I, and I thought you were going to say Jock Strap. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot, too. <laughs> Either way, these are good nicknames for John. I think we should keep them. <laughs> nice having you on the show, Debbie. <laughs> you know, I, one, of, one of the things that I'm concerned about, particularly the deep fate, if we think about there's some, been, been some high-profile legal cases that have been solved because of the prevalence of video. We have video of there's the Kyle Rittenhouse thing, and there's some others where the, the, the fact of the video broke the case one way or the other. We can get to the point where... In the legal system, the people are going to get in trouble for stuff that they didn't do, or be exonerated for stuff they did do. And can I, before we go, and uh, only, and can we really tell if they did or did not do it? That's a huge question because uh, there are, as fast as deep fakes are developing, uh, there of course are countermeasures uh, in uh, detection software that is that is being uh, worked on and there's contests that um, like there was a 10 million dollar contest a couple of years ago sponsored by uh, uh, Microsoft and Facebook and there's continuing contests uh, on that are ongoing but that one that was sponsored by Facebook and and Microsoft came up with only a 65% accuracy in detecting deep fakes, which I thought was a little unnerving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, however, um, there's one now that uh, was this year where there was a $100,000 prize to a team from Singapore uh, because they their detector was 98.53% accurate. Um, and that's, that's getting up there, but as fast as they develop these detections, the um, creators of deep fakes are way ahead. They are already um, far ahead, making it more and more difficult to detect. And the you know the black hats, if you will, are always acting. The white hats are always reacting to what something the black hats have done. So we're already behind. You know, automatically behind because it's it's defensive rather than offensive. Debbie Burke so, is our guest here. A moment, I want to plug your book real quick, uh, Debbie. It's called Deep Fake Double Down. It's coming out on April the twenty fifth. If you go to debbieburkewriter dot com, you can pre order the book, uh, Deep Fake Double Down. And uh, if you could, Debbie, get into the plot of the book a little bit and tell us about your characters. Well, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the uh, book is set in the fictional town of Blue Rock, Montana, and you won't find that on any map. Um, the only place you might hear about it is in Willie Nelson's song, The Red-Headed Stranger from 1975. Do any of you remember that? Yes, yes. That's very okay, good. I'm first, a Willie Nelson first, fan. I remember that. Yeah. yeah, the first line is the red-headed stranger from Blue Rock, Montana, rode into town one day. And so, that anyway, is. the uh, Blue Rock does not exist. Um, and I 
did this purposely because there is a corrupt prison and a corrupt prison warden and guard who are running a fraud. And I didn't want to name a real county in Montana because I have to live here. (laughs) Good move. So so anyway, I made it up, and um, the premise behind the the fraud that the the warden is, is committing is that they're, they built the prison on an old abandoned gold mining uh, area. And Montana has been very rich for gold, silver, copper, and other precious metals for you know, since the eight, 1800s. Um, and back then, when the prospectors were searching for gold, they kept running across these little blue rocks. And they were kind of annoyed because they really wanted to find gold. Well, it turns out these little blue rocks were rare Yogo sapphires, which are only found in Montana, and they became very valuable and desirable. Uh, For instance, there's Yogos that are in the crown jewels of England. And so the Yogo sapphires are the MacGuffin in the story, Um, and it's uh, the... Warden is entrepreneur, uh, and he revives the old abandoned gold mine on the property to uh, uh, support the prison. And gold mining is profitable when you have cheap inmate labor, and the investors are happy, and the warden is the darling of the corrections industry. However, he and a corrupt guard find the surprise mother load of Joko sapphires. And so, you know, why mention that to the investors when the warden and the guard can pocket some millions. However, there's a young Native American inmate who learns about this operation, and the guard kills him. And another guard, a female uh, guard named Lucille, witnesses the murder, and she has to flee for her life because they're wanting to silence her too. And uh, to keep the public from believing Lucille, the warden creates deep fake videos that make it appear that the inmate and she, who's a much older woman, are lovers, and she helped him escape. And so these fake videos go viral on social media, and every cop in Montana is gunning for the fugitive couple. So while they're on the, while she's on the run, uh, she calls my main characters of the series, who are investigator Tawny Lindholm and her high octane attorney husband Tillman Rosenbaum. And she tells him this incredible story that uh, doesn't at all match with what the video is showing that's on the news all the time. So she then disappears, and they are tracing after her, and things continue to get more and more complicated as as the story goes on. But nothing is as it seems because of the deep fakes. And I wrote it, I wrote Deep Fake Double Down. It's, it's a fast paced beach read, but it also deals with the serious theme of how double fakes, deep fakes can be used to invent events that never happened and make innocent people appear guilty. And so that was, uh, that was my uh, genesis for, for writing the story. John Gilstrap. First of all, it sounds like a fascinating story, and it sounds like something that would be all too easy to happen in real life. And again, the pernicious part of all of this with the deep fake technology is once the video is out there, it will always be real to the people who want it to be real. So in a, if it's in a, in a partisan in, environment and you know, all things are political at one level or another, so you've got an, a, somebody that's running for their life and it would seem to me that the, the images of, are, are so much more powerful than the than the explanation of, of why they're fake. It kind of, sounds kind of terrifying to me. It is. It is terrifying. Um, one of the things that um, has been uh, mentioned is, of course, political figures are uh, prime prime material for uh, creating deep fakes and having words come out of their mouth that they never said. Um, and there's something that's come up now called the liar's dividend, and that is the point where um, you, a politician, for instance, could come out and say, I never said that. It's, it's absolutely fake. It's a deep fake. 
And so then the liar gets the benefit of the doubt. So because we can't tell if they said it or not or did whatever event, um, you know, whatever embarrassing thing that they they are supposed to have done that was caught on camera. So it's you don't know what's real and what isn't. Author Debbie Burke is our guest here on the program. So, Debbie, how did you research AI? Who who, who helped you and uh, how much knowledge did you gain at the end of your research versus what you had going in? Well, I, <laughs> I have about a quarter of 1% of knowledge of AI because it is such a huge, huge topic. Uh, but I do have... I, I have a lot of really smart friends, and so one of the things that I have done um, is reach out to a number of my friends who are uh, very well versed, uh, and uh, they are they help me along so I don't sound like a total idiot when I'm describing <laughs> describing the process. Um, but again, I didn't get into it for the story purposes. It's a thriller. It's fast moving. I didn't get into the nuts and bolts of creating a deep fake too much um, because I'm I'm not a Tom Clancy techno thriller writer. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's very. Um, the more I read, the more I got distressed and the more concerned. Um, uh, one of my friends is um, Harvard, Harvard uh, educated PhD who taught at Oxford, and she had reviewed the passages that involved deep fakes, and she said she she thought they sounded um, you know sounded pretty accurate, which was reassuring because I was not wanting to get too much into the nuts and bolts, but I wanted to sound uh, convincing and authentic. And that's that was the purpose for the research. But again, it's one of these things that the deeper you get into it, the more it is. And it's uh, it's just um, scary, just scary stuff. Well, Debbie, um, uh, I'm frightened just listening to it today. And uh, and I, I find your the your book to be fascinating. And I think I'm going to uh, probably read it. Uh, but well, come thank you. I appreciate that. But. Coming back to the to every, the problems facing us on a everyday basis, you mentioned there was a couple of groups that have uh, established algorithms that can evaluate or detect the accuracy of some of these statements and uh, determine whether they're deep fake or actual events. Uh, one you said was in Singapore, I think 99, 98.5%. The from a logistics point of view, how would how are these algorithms going to be utilized? How can they be utilized? Uh, would it be well? How can they be utilized? Boy, that is a huge question that I really am not qualified to answer. Um, I'm guessing that they will put uh, some of these. Uh, social media platforms have banned deep fakes or limited their use. Um, I'm guessing that they will have to install some sort of AI software that detects uh, detects what is posted on their sites uh, and whether it's how how accurate it is and how much they catch, I don't know, but it's just such a huge overwhelming amount. Um, for instance, um, Chat GPT has been in the news recently, and the developers of the, that program uh, have kind of uh, shut off access to their free trial version because their um, viral deep fakes have just gone through the moon to the moon since they since they offered the technology. And so they they are trying to restrict it somewhat, but again, we're all, they're always playing catch up to a technology that is light years ahead. Well, and it so, it can be even bigger than this. First of all, I I did a search of myself on Chat GPT. You know who's John Gilstrap? Mm -hmm. Every detail was wrong. <laughs> Every detail. They have me living in Maryland. They have you know it's all kinds of stuff. It's kind of strange. But Bill, as a as a former ship driver. 
if we if we look at the deep fake technology, isn't it possible that we have warships at at sea that are presented with threats that aren't real that they will respond to and and yeah the the whole world is going to be a world of illusion and trying to determine what is what is real and what is not real and as we talked earlier there's a lot of positive benefits they can be used in a positive way but the 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 illusionary aspect to me is very very frightening and we know there's evil out there that will attempt to capitalize on this yeah. and use it to yeah. their benefit. Exactly, and, yeah. And, and sowing uh, discord around the world, creating turmoil, is a goal yeah. of uh, many of these anarchists out there uh, because it gives them an opportunity to, to seize control themselves. In fact, there was something on the news last night or yesterday uh, about President Biden, uh, a, a AI or deep fake uh, with his voice, uh, uh, it was it was somewhat benign, so it's nothing to really get alarmed about. But it's just an example mm -hmm. of what could be done, and there's no limits to it. And there is nothing benign, especially at that level. Mm -hmm. And this isn't a shot at, at President Biden, but you know the truth is the truth, and polished truth. It's one thing to edit a transcript and make it look better. That's fine because the original stuff yeah. is still there. But when you get down to video and electronic information, once you start manipulating that, you've crossed a line that's really hard yeah. to it, step back from. Exactly. Yeah. Debbie Burke is our guest. DebbieBurkeWriter.com is the website where you can go to find out more about Debbie's works. And you can also pre-order Deep Fake Double Down at DebbieBurkeWriter.com. That's Burke, B-U-R-K-E. It'll come out on April the 25th. Uh, Debbie, so what inspired you to move into the AI genre? <laughs> um, I I like to, you know, as I said before, my books are beach reads. They're mm -hmm. not, you know, serious literature. But I do like to tackle um, timely topics. Um, uh, one of my earlier books dealt with drone surveillance. Um, uh, so it's just things that... I'm not good at, but I like to learn. I approach every uh, every topic. I also write um, nonfiction articles, mm -hmm. and I approach every topic and every person I interview as a student. And I say I'm ignorant, but I'm willing. Teach me everything you know. And so this is how I approach the uh, the research that I do. And I just find. Find people who are willing to talk to me, and most of the time, people are very willing to talk about their um, their particular expertise. So that's that's how I get into it is is from a a journalist point of view initially, but then of course it turns into into fiction. <laughs> You used the term earlier, white hat, hats and black hats. Of course, I my generation relates to that. Uh, where in Montana do you live, if I may ask? Um, in northwest Montana, near Glacier Park. Oh, beautiful, beautiful area. So. Well, come and visit me. It, it, it really is beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Debbie, thanks so much for being on the program today. John, any final author-to-author -author stuff? No, I was just going to say come and visit Debbie. She has a lot of radon test kits in the trunk of her car. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey I'm, I was interested to hear that you have radon in West Virginia because there is also radon in Montana. And so test kits are somewhat, uh, somewhat popular here, too. Well, we need them because of our topography. <laughs> okay. Radon is certainly an issue around here. Debbie, thank you so much for your time this morning. We appreciate it. Thanks, Debbie. Well, thank you, Rob and John and Admiral. It's been a real, real pleasure and real honor to talk to you. Have a good day. Okay. And that again at 831, Debbie Burke, DebbieBurkeWriter.com. The book is called Deep Fake Double Down, out on April the 25th.